Happy Thursday and welcome back to Locked On Red Sox podcast. Thank you so much for making Locked On Red Sox your first listen every single day. I'm your host, Massachusetts team insider, Jake Ignazewski, and I will also be joined by my co-host, Nesson writer, Lauren Campbell. Lauren and I had the opportunity today to interview former Red Sox top prospect, Ryan Westmoreland. And he's going to talk a little bit about his experience growing up in Rhode Island, as well as getting drafted by the Red Sox and some of his success early on in his minor league career. And this is going to be part one of our interview with Ryan. So let's listen in to our conversation with Ryan Westmoreland. You are locked on Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are here with former Red Sox top prospect, Ryan Westmoreland. So how are we doing today, Ryan? Doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So uh, I just wanted to start off the episode real fast um, with this quote that I heard. And um, I think it goes perfectly with your sort of story and, um, you know, everything that you, that, that you went through throughout your life. And um, it goes, you must not allow the clock and calendar to blind you to the fact that each moment is a miracle and a mystery. And uh, I, I heard that today. And even, even when I just said it, it just gave myself chills. But I, th- I thought that the listeners would really like it. I, th- I thought it would be a perfect way to sort of start off, you know, us talking about your, your incredible journey and your incredible story. Uh-huh. It's a great one. Appreciate it. So I want to start off sort of talking about a little bit, um, you know, how was the end of your 2021? How was the holidays and um, how has 2022 gone so far, you know, in the five days that we, we've been in this year? So far, so good. Um, this past year, I got married and <clears throat> I have a nine month old daughter. So it's kind of her first everything over the holidays. So that was really exciting. And um, all the family got to see her and um you know due to co uh due to covid last year they all of them didn't get to see her so it was nice to be able to all get together and um unfortunately it looks like um things are taking a turn for the worst covid wise so um just you know grateful to be here and and have a have a family like i do and um you know trying to stay positive yeah well congratulations on a, a solid 2021 uh, that's obviously a lot to celebrate right there um, the Red Sox also had a pretty good 2021, not as good as yours, but were you surprised that the Red Sox did as well as they did in 2021? Um, I, I was, I wouldn't say surprised because I know a lot of them and I know that they're really, really good at baseball. Um, you know, but as a fan, um, I certainly didn't expect the run that they made, um, especially in the first half. Uh, it was very impressive and, you know, I'm not, surprised because like i said i do know them and i know what they're capable of doing um but it was certainly a a nice surprise seeing how how well they did and um the run they made against you know new york and obviously the first half of the season was i mean i don't think anyone thought that was gonna happen so um exciting 100 percent. And, and for people that don't know ryan grew up in rhode island and grew up as a red sox fan and um i'm, I'm curious for, from all, all the you know personalities that were on 2020 on the red sox 2021 team uh was there anybody that you enjoyed watching the most uh i would I, I mean i'm gonna say christian vasquez um from the the pretty much the sole perspective of he's a really really good friend of mine um for no i mean he's obviously a very good baseball player but Um, I've always really rooted for him just because we have a very good relationship, like friends who kind of came up minor leagues together. Um, So I'm certainly always rooting for him. Um, But, you know, I've always liked Hunter Renfro. I love the way he played in Tampa and in San Diego. Um, Certainly upset that, or I wouldn't say upset that he's leaving because it's, you know, good for him. Um, He deserves it. Um, But we're getting Jackie Bradley in return, which, another really good friend of mine so i love the trade personally just because i love jackie and what he brings to this team and obviously being his friend is it's nice to have him back yeah i think a lot of fans were shocked by the trade and i think hunter renfo really kind of 
embraced Boston almost immediately and he became a fan favorite very quick with all the assists and everything in the outfield. So it was definitely a, like people were upset, but then seeing Jackie Bradley come back, who was a fan favorite as well, yeah. they're like, oh, well, I don't really know how to feel because it's yeah, tough. It's, it's tough because I mean, Hunter, he had an incredible year. I mean, all the the assists, like you said, in the outfield, and then he had some huge hits and home runs. Um, but, you know, we're getting the guy in return that's debatably the best defensive outfielder there is. Um, and, you know, it's a it's a tough trade because of how good Hunter did at the end of last season. But, I mean, you got to think about what we're getting in return, and that's just as good, in my opinion. 1,000%. Yeah, you had me shed a little bit of a tear when you brought Hunter Renfro. I, I, I honestly left my memory that he wasn't going to be on the 2022 yeah. team. I completely forgot about that trade because this offseason and lockout has been taking forever. Yeah. Uh, but I, I got to ask you sort of what was your reaction uh, during that Christian Vasquez walk-off in the ALDS against the Rays? Because that game, I actually remember watching it. I mean, it started really early in the day and then, you know, ended, you know, maybe at like 8 or 9 at night. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was an emotional roller coaster that, that night. Um, but that was incredible. I mean, I was so excited that it was Christian. Um, and I think one of, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but one of the, the pictures that have gone around a lot of me and the monitors are of me and Christian. Um, so actually, once that all happened, that picture got sent to me like a bazillion times. Um, but I was, I was so pumped up. I was so jacked up because I know um him off the field and i know the kind of kid he is and he deserved that moment it's always good to see and hear about somebody like christian vasquez who seems like a genuine person i've only uh communicated with him in red sox press conferences but mm -hmm. to hear like off the field that he seems like a very genuine person i mean his instagram seems like a very good family oriented just all around good person that you want in your life yeah, I, I like that too. I mean, it's it's such a not I wouldn't even say misconception about some of the athletes out there, but you know, you always love seeing a guy that you get to see his personality off the field. And um, I remember David Ortiz was like that too. You got to know David off the field, um, and yeah, it's it's a good thing because you know, as an athlete, you want you want people to know how you are on the field, but more importantly, how you are off it. I hope you guys have been enjoying our conversation thus far with former Red Sox top prospect Ryan Westmoreland. But Lauren just wanted to take a second to tell you about Built Bar. But I want to tell you about Built Bar. You know me by now. You know how much I absolutely love Built Bar. And now that it's the new year, that means some New Year's resolutions are starting to kick in. And if yours is about getting fit, maybe eating a little bit healthier, make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the best protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. It doesn't have that chalkiness, maybe that cardboard taste that some other protein bars have. And it makes it easy to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good, you will want to eat it unlike those other protein bars, like I said, that can be a little chalky, a little cardboardy, maybe even a little waxy. It's just not good. Built Bar is not like that at all. There are so many flavors to choose from. There's raspberry double chocolate, mint chocolate, and my favorite, cookies and cream. And Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. So by like week three of your resolution, when getting eating healthy is getting a little bit tricky, you kind of thinking, where's the chocolate? Built Bar. Built Bar is where the chocolate is at. And we have an offer for you. Go to built.com, use offer code LOCKED15 for 15% 15 off your order. That's locked 15 for 15% off at built.com. Definitely make sure that you check out Built Bar and use the code to get some discounts. Now let's get back to the, our conversation with Ryan Westmoreland. 1000%. It's, it's, it's always really interesting to see what people are like, you know, outside of the game. And, um, you know, you brought up Jackie Bradley Jr. and Christian Vasquez as two guys that, that you played with during your minor league time with the Red Sox. I was wondering if there was any other teammates that you really enjoyed playing with um, during your time. Yeah, um, I mean, a, a lot. Uh, you know, Xander Bogarts and uh, Mookie Betts were two of the the best people I ever met. Obviously, it's, you know, they're two of the best players in the major leagues right now. Um, but I got to know them as friends and kind of like what we were talking about before. Um, I got to know them off the field, you know, at my house, at their house, during spring training, just kind of hanging out, playing ping pong and video games and, you know, <laughs> nothing baseball related, just hanging out as friends. 
Um, and they'll always be friends. They'll always be, you know, close to me, whether, you know, they're in LA or, or here in Boston. It's uh, those kind of relationships are the ones that I'm, you know, always going to treasure. That makes me wonder what, what, what sort of video games did you guys play? And uh, who, who's the better video game player? Well, we played Call of Duty. That was kind of the, the peak time of Call of Duty when it was coming up. Um, I don't remember. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say Mookie is the best at everything just because wow. he is the best at everything. Um, I don't I don't remember specifically, but I can I can make good, good guesstimate that he's probably the best. That's so he, he can bowl, play baseball, and play video games. So he's yeah. just like duality of a man. <laughs> yeah, you, you name it. I mean, he's probably good at, you know, everything. Chess, you, you name it. And he'll, he'll figure it out. That's, that's not surprising just knowing how good he and dominant he is at baseball. Um, you were one of the top prospects. You were number 21 ranked on Baseball America's list of top prospects. And also playing in Boston, is there – or did you feel any type of pressure as a, as an athlete being named a top prospect? Yeah, I did at first, um, you know, just being the, the new England kid, um, getting these rewards and rankings. And I felt pressure just cause, you know, I, I, I felt like there were people out there that thought I was getting these, these accolades just because I was a Red Sox fan. I'm from new England and all that stuff. And, so I did feel a lot of pressure, not to mention, you know, I was a teenager um, uh, among the, in that list of, of prospects. So, um, yeah, it was definitely a lot of pressure there. But at the end of the day, I just I said, you know, let's just let my my ability take care of itself. Um, and I growing up, I knew how the Boston media, I, I knew how, you know, bad performance didn't look good. And you don't want that, obviously, as a, as a player. Um, so I just said, you know, I'm not going to get into all that stuff. And just go out and do what I do and, and let my ability take care of itself. I think that's so smart because there's a ton of outside noise, especially in a major market like Boston and kind of the more you can not necessarily tune it out, but not exactly listen. I feel like just sets you up so much better for the future. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, just one less thing to worry about, obviously the, you know, how you're looking towards the media, but, um, you know, like you said, in a market like Boston or LA or New York, you, you obviously want to stay out of the negative spotlight when you can. So, um, just kind of putting your head down and, and going to work every day is I, in my opinion, that's, that's the way to go. Yeah. That's the perfect mindset. I, th I think Bill Belichick would, would, would really like that mindset as well. That's usually what, what we hear from most of his players. Yeah. yeah well, you tell him to give me a call. I'll, I'll come in there. Hang out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, you, like, like I also mentioned, you also grew up in Rhode Island as well. And I, I bet when you got drafted by the Red Sox in the fifth round in, in 2008, um, you, you sort of felt that pressure as sort of like a hometown kid uh, that you had to live up those to those expectations, mm -hmm. um, especially growing up as a Red Sox fan as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was tough just because, um, you know, obviously it was a dream come true, but at the same time, uh, you know, I'm in New England and I got hundreds of thousands of people just staring at me and, you know, I'm an 18 year old kid. Um, so it was tough at first and I was forced to, to mature through it, but I think I did. And, um, I had a good first year in, in Lowell and single A and, um, you know, kind of, was able to put all that stuff on me and, and like like you had said tune it out and kind of just play baseball yeah definitely and then going into your second season is when things changed a bit for you mm -hmm. um at what point did you kind of realize something was not right here yeah so it was i i mean i was there and and because i had a condo down in florida so i'd been working out every day there um and like mid early february is when people started to report and we'd take, you know, live BP scrimmage kind of things, nothing formal. Um, so I would say late February, there was one day or the night before I, had, I was actually playing video games, of course. Um, I noticed my hand felt like it was asleep, um, but it didn't, nothing hurt. So I was, I kind of just brushed it off and said, you know, maybe my hand's just asleep. We'll see how it you know, feels in the morning. Um, and then when I got to, to the facility, we were doing like dynamic stretching, um, and I just felt really numb and weak and, um, off balance. Um, so that's kind of the point when I realized, Hey, 
you know, my hand's not just asleep. There's something going on here. I, did, I had no idea what it was going to be, but I knew that, you know, the red flags were going off and I knew something wasn't right. And when you like got your diagnostics and heard of this thing called cavornis malformation, um, f- funny enough, I-, I remember first time I interviewed you, I had to say that to myself, like literally like ten times to make sure I pronounced it correctly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what what was your what was your first reaction uh, when you first heard um, that well, this is I, what you were diagnosed yeah. with? I mean, honestly, like I, I mean, I was eighteen, nineteen years old, so when I saw the MRI and I. It was a big white golf ball looking thing and you know i had no idea what that was i knew um i knew it wasn't supposed to be there i knew that you know whatever it was was that that white spot was not supposed to be on the mri um but i had no idea what it meant um like for my career like what it even was um so i just knew that you know by the look in the the staff's face and uh, obviously the person reading the mri I could tell that it was serious. I didn't know what, I didn't know about surgery. I didn't even know what, what was the next step. Um, but I could tell that it was, it was a serious thing. And I, you know, when I called my parents, they obviously were upset. And I, that's, that's kind of when it kind of sat it sank in that something was going on. I hope you guys have been enjoying our conversation with Ryan Westmoreland thus far, but I just want to take a second to talk to you about bet online. Bet Online would like to wish you a happy new betting year as we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond. Bet Online remains the number one spot for all the best sports waging action for 2022. New year and a new updated desktop and mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% off welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code locked on to get started. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to wager all your favorite sports. BetOnline, where the game starts. At such a young age, too, it's so hard to have such a positive mindset when you know something is wrong, when you're not exactly sure what it is, you probably have so many questions in that moment. Mm -hmm. Did you have a positive mindset going into that surgery when you decided that that's what you needed to do? I did. I was always, I mean, I, I was always, um, you know, optimistic through all of this, um, you know, being such a passionate and driven kid in the first place, you know, I, my mindset was, I'm going to beat this thing. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to, get back out there rehab and, and, you know, play center field at Fenway. Um, and I felt that for a while. Um, but obviously things, you know, things happened and, you know, it is what it is. Um, but I certainly was, was about as positive as I could have been through this whole thing. Um, and I think that's a big reason why I am, you know, still here is because I had that mindset and that, that will and that drive to, you know, to rehab my butt off and to do everything I could to get back on the field. Um, unfortunately, I didn't. Um, well, I did kind of, but, um, you know, I didn't get to Fenway. Um, but, you know, you know, I gave my best shot, certainly. I don't regret that. A thousand percent. And uh, especially, like, when you first found out, you know, if it's on, if, if this, uh, you know, disease is left untreated, you, you can either be blind, paralyzed, or, or killed, like, I mean, when you heard that, um, I, I bet I bet it must have been a little bit difficult to keep that positive mindset. Uh, but how were, how were you able to, you know, keep going to especially after that first surgery um, to try and get back, uh, especially to to your playing potential? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, that was a real tough uh, conversation when he told me, you know, the what ifs, like what if all these things could happen? Um, but like I said before, being the kid I was, I. I said, I'm going to, you know, option three, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to be fine. Nothing's going to happen. Um, but the reason I got back to where I did was, you know, I, I said to myself, no one's ever done this before. And if anyone can, if anyone in the world was able to come back from, you know, brainstem surgery, like, like what I had, it's got to be me. Um, so that I kind of had that mindset, like the, you know, prove to everyone that I'm capable of doing this. Um, and you know, that's what kept me going, whether it was a good day or bad days, you know, saying, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be the guy that does this. 
I think that's an incredible mindset to have. And, um, you know, again, being a teenager, thinking you may have your future lined up and just being a teenager in general, you're still trying to navigate life and the world as a whole. Um, you mentioned so many things that kind of kept your, kept your mind right, even though you had to relearn to do the smallest tasks mm -hmm. and then, you know, like tying your shoes and, you know, everyday things that we probably take for granted just because it's mm -hmm. like second nature to us. Right. Um, but you were, like you said, you were able to get back on the field in a Red Sox Dominican Instructional League game. Um, just how did that feel being able to at least do that um, at that point, having been through all you had had been through? Yeah, no, that was that was incredible just because, you know, it was one of those situations where I could look back and say, you know, eight, six, seven, eight months ago, I couldn't even see straight. And here I am playing against, you know, some of the best players in the world. Um, so it was special, obviously very special, the fact that I had already gotten back there. Um, I certainly wasn't up to, you know, 100%, like nothing happened. Um, I obviously still had some issues that I was going to get through. But more importantly, um, you know, I would say to myself, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. You know, I've already made it back this far in this amount of time. Like, who's to say that I can't just keep this up? And who knows how long it'll be, but I'll be back and, you know, hopefully you make it to the major league. So um, that was a very, very special time and um, certainly one I'll always remember. All right, Ben. And uh, for, for people who don't know exactly what Cavornis malformation is, because um, I, I know that you're a big advocate for it, obviously, and um, trying to raise awareness about what it's all about. Can you, can you explain it a little bit? Yeah. So, I mean, basically, I mean, to it's basically a tangle of blood vessels um it's kind of like a blood clot um that, that blood out um and and mine be on the brainstem um they could be anywhere in your head like they're you know some people have like 30 of them and never know because they don't bleed um but mine i had one that was on the brainstem which is the worst spot to have it and mine bled which is obviously the most unlucky thing you can have um but the thing i found most interesting that I think not pretty much no one really knows is these malformations are like uh, like birthmarks. So there's a good chance I've had this since I was born. It just decided, and you know, in February of 2010, it decided that that's when it was going to bleed. You know, it wasn't like a, a tumor that grew. Um, it was just always been there. Um, you can't do anything like hit your head. Nothing is going to make it bleed. At least that I know of. Um, but you know, it's just an unlucky situation that I was in. Um, but like I said, it's, it's very, it's not very common, but it's, it's a thing it's out there and a lot of people have them. Um, and some people can't get surgery. I was lucky not to get surgery, um, but some people aren't that lucky. So, um, it's certainly a cause that means a lot to me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing a little bit of information and, just knowing that it could be something that you've had your entire life is to me a little scary because like you said, it can bleed at any time. And it just right. one day decided that that was the day that it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And thankfully that you, something set you off in order to be like, this can't be right here. Right. It, yeah, exactly. And it's, it's funny cause well, it's not, it's certainly not funny. Um, but like I said, you guys before, I was told or not, I was kind of tipped off that something was going on because my leg was numb and I, I kind of had signs that something was going on for my second surgery. It was the exact opposite where I had zero idea, nothing felt off, no tingling, nothing. Um, I was just doing a routine checkup at an MRI and they get the call saying you're going to Arizona. So that was probably more scary just because. I had no idea what was going on. I didn't feel any different. I was actually playing golf with my friends, um, but I, I felt great and nothing, I felt like nothing was wrong. So it just goes to show that, I mean, yeah, like you said, a drop of the hat, it's all, something's going on, something could happen. I hope you guys did enjoy part one of our conversation with former Red Sox top prospect, Ryan Westmoreland. And make sure to check out part two tomorrow where Ryan talks a little bit about how he got his unfortunate disease of Gavornis malformation and what lessons he's learned and also how he's still trying to make an impact in baseball today. Now, 
Thank you so much for making Locked On Red Sox your first listen every single day. Now make your second listen Locked On Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs, Locked On Bets. Hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. It's free and available on all platforms. And also make sure you give Locked On Red Sox a follow on Twitter because we are posting daily Red Sox content. Even though there's a lockout going on and even though it's the offseason, we still want to get you guys excited for the 2022 season. And we also try to get you involved in every single episode on our Twitter. So make sure, like I said, to go over there and follow us on that. Also follow myself on Twitter. It's at Jake Iggy. And also follow my co-host, Lauren Campbell, on Twitter. It's Three Laws, Lauren with four R's. So thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode of Locked On Red Sox. And like I said, make sure to tune in tomorrow for part two of our conversation with former Red Sox top prospect, Ryan Westmoreland. We really appreciate all the support on all these player interviews. And we'll see you guys and talk to you guys tomorrow. Peace.